Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about all things sci-fi and fantasy. We particularly focus on that most wonderful of subgenres, steampunk. Today, I am continuing my quest to list the top novels, my top favorite novels, and the top best novels in different sci-fi, in different uh, areas of science fiction, different kind of themes and classifications. Today, I am wearing my crazy looking road warrior type goggles in order to talk about dystopias. You may notice that a lot of my previous lists have focused on newer works of literature, uh, things that have come out recently. This list is more of the classics and is much closer to the top picks that almost any um, literature specialist would choose as far as the this dystopia goes with at least one sleeper in there. I always like to have one that's not as well known in order to promote it because this particular one should be in the top ten if it's not. Before I continue, I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion. This is my first published novel, a Centrifugal Force, from 2012, and it is dystopian in nature, kind of a political dystopia in which people have to fight for freedom. America has become very totalitarian. Might have some uh, some resonance with uh, things as they are today. And it's available in Kindle ebook form and also in physical form, as you see here. And you might, if you like dystopia, you may find it interesting. My top ten dystopias, and these are for the most part classics. Number 10, Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, published 1986. I read this one recently. I had a bit, bit of trepidation because I'd heard it was very feminist. And feminism these days can be kind of strident. But because this was published in the 1980s, it was back when feminism was mostly concerned with women's rights. So uh, that was a good thing, in my view. It concerns the uh, tale of a far-right religious cult uh, taking over the United States and uh, depriving women of all the rights and basically turning it into this dictatorship. Women have been divorced or something like that. They're pressed into concubinage, uh, basically sexual slavery to produce more children because this society also has environmental catastrophes which have depressed the birth rate. Uh, chemicals, Agent Orange, things like that. So that the heroine is of Fred because women have lost their names entirely, or at least these concubines have, and they're named after their their owner, you know, their um, master, so to speak. And uh, this, she's, it's somewhere near Boston, I believe, and she's in servitude to one of these um, commanders of the religious cult that, that um, rules the country. And they're always at war trying to, to, um, eliminate all dissent, including like Catholics and Baptists. They, they, they like hang Catholics as heretics. So it's feminist, but it also shows how this order is oppressive, very oppressive to men as well. You can't have your own religion and you, a lot of them poor men are deprived of wives entirely because these commanders, they get the pick of the litter essentially. And uh, the other, the other men have to be satisfied with whatever you know, whatever society throws to you, whether you love the woman or not. Uh, the ending is kind of ambiguous, and you, you're you not actually sure what entirely happened, but it's definitely one way to end a dystopia. And it kind of ends on a hopeful note, uh, is all I'll say. But it's not, don't let the feminism scare you away. It's, it's definitely not as strident as something that would, would have been written in the current year. Number nine. Now, I may get in a little trouble for this one, uh, because as of late, this, this novel has fallen out of favor. I still think it belongs in the list. Camp of the Saints by Jean Raspail, 1973. This is the only novel in my list that was not originally written in English. It was written in French. And uh, now, today, it's been derided as a racist, terrible racist book. There are some issues that I found disturbing. The, the whole premise is that 
uh, a million Indian refugees commandeer these old freighters and sail for Europe and they're going to land in France and demand to be taken in. A million of them. And the havoc this causes. And there's uh, there's some issues. I think the author had no knowledge of Indian culture because some of the some of the portrayals are absolutely ludicrous. But in any case, in any case, you, you, anytime you have a mass of impoverished, desperate people uh, invading your shores, bad things are going to happen. The most interesting point about this novel that makes is that basically French society destroys itself as it's waiting for these refugees to arrive. They try to dissuade them, you know, they try to persuade them, but they don't take any actual action because they're so, they feel so guilty uh, about, about these people being unarmed and starving. And uh, the society essentially tears itself apart. They, they bring up the most radical leftist elements come to the fore and they, they uh, open prisons and the prisoners uh, go amok and, and they basically murder people. <laughs> this is a glorious revolution, but it doesn't work out very well. And people are shooting each other. And this is all before any of the refugees arrive. It's, it's kind of like it, it drives society mad. And, and it has a portrayal of the elites as being self, uh, self-righteous and ignorant in the sense that they want to welcome these refugees, but some of them, some of the elites themselves are like murdered by escaped criminals because they're so, uh, they're so blinded by the, their ideology. And I just love the way it sends up the press and the bureaucrats and all these, these self-righteous progressives that don't have a grip of reality. So, if you're not too oversensitive about, you know, stupid portrayals of Indians, I mean, in the sense that, you know, mis for example, misportraying their culture as promiscuous rather than rather preatonical, which it is, uh, if you can overlook that, I think this is a pretty good book and not, and not really racist because it's, it's more about the ability of the Western society to protect itself or not. Number eight. Here's another one that will earn me enmity on from the um, from the left, and that is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, 1957. Now, you've no doubt heard of this. I mean, Ayn Rand, the famous libertarian icon, although she <laughs> actually hated that term, and uh, the the novel. Uh, open to tons of negative reviews, and they called her a fascist, which was absurd. You know, they called her a Nazi, but it's absurd, absurd because she was Jewish, and and a exile from communism, from Soviet communism. And so the premise you probably have heard of this, but the premise is, is there's a you know a kind of a renegade individual called John Galt who's on the minds of everybody, even though nobody knows who he is. At the same time, there's an economic depression and, and lots of bureaucracy and things just keep getting worse because of the government like nationalizing things and, and uh, taking away incentives. And uh, there's a heroic, there's definitely a heroic female character, Dagny Taggart. And those who denigrate Rand definitely should, should consider that, that she's very heroic. And she does often have women in heroic roles. So they're fighting this confiscatory government. There are, there, for example, there's a, a Spanish pirate <laughs> who is actually robbing government ships and giving money back to the businessmen from whom it was stolen. <laughs> and uh, I, I love the, that, um, that inversion of the usual Robin Hood idea. But anyway, the worst aspect of this is it can get preachy at times, of course, if you know anything about Rand, and there's like this multi-page speech that John Galt uh, does near the end where he finally he takes over the radio and he's giving this speech about how, how foolish the people have been to trust in government and to think that they can make something out of nothing, blah, 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 blah. And it's been an inspiration for a lot of people, a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republican congressmen will say that this was an inspiring book to them, and hurrah, hurrah for that. Uh, the idea of Atlas Shrugging is the idea that these businessmen, these pillars of society are going to withdraw and let society collapse. If you don't appreciate them, why should they stick around? So I definitely recommend this one. As long as you don't, you can, might want to skip over the speech a little bit.
Number seven, A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, 1962. This is most famously a movie by Stanley Kubrick and uh, a very uh, violent and disturbing movie, but nonetheless uh, fantastically made, uh, made and a bit of genius. I, I read the book, again, I read the book a long time ago. I read the book before the movie came out. And uh, it involves a young thug uh, named Alex. This is in uh, uh, Britain that's become ravaged by crime. These criminals run amok and it seems like the police don't stop them or they, they don't want to. They have these bars where they drink milk that's spiked with drugs and Moloko Plus. They have this cool ling lingo called NADSAT which is mixed with Russian supposedly because of Russian propaganda on the uh, on the airwaves. Although that I found the, the, the most fun element but also the least plausible because I don't think thugs are very uh, very likely to learn any foreign languages, uh, being kind of lazy by nature. And so, you know, Alex commits some horrible crimes and eventually is caught and, and sentenced. Oh, he's a murderer. They sentence him to this brainwashing where he's uh, deconditioned against violence so that he gets sick if he becomes violent. And uh, it... Uh, and it's, it, the irony is, it's, for example, there's this novelist that was talking against this brainwashing, and yet it turns out that he was a victim of one of Alex's horrific crimes. And, and, uh, and it's, uh, so it's kind of a, a little bit of a send-up of that as well, of perhaps uh, liberal sympathies. And uh, it's most interesting, and I recently found this out, is that there was an extra chapter to Clockwork Orange that 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 wasn't published in the United States because because they thought we were too cynical where Alex kind of decides to turn over a new leaf instead of instead of turning back to violence instead of overcoming his brainwashing and turning back to violence uh, interesting one of these days I have to look that up and and see how that goes number six Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury 1953 and uh, 451, uh, 451 degrees is the is the temperature at which paper spontaneously combusts, and it's so named because in this society, books are banned. I mean, physical reading material is banned because the government can't control it. They, if you have to watch videos and so on because they can censor those because those are those are only available through the network. <laughs> and that sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> People like losing their their um, people not having physical copies of anything anymore and all being online. Hmm, what does that remind you of? Anyway, the hero is Guy Montag, who is a fireman, which in this world means that you um, seek out illegal books and burn them. And uh, in this case, his wife Mildred is, um, you know, is very distraught for whatever reason, tries to commit suicide. This is kind of a grim society, so it's not surprising. Surprising. He meets this neighbor named Clarice, who uh, has, who basically has these bookish sympathies. He gets he gets a couple copies of books, and he gets found out by his own agency, who burn his house down for being for being um, like a traitor to that book destruction campaign. And he ends up, you know, joining a society of of book lovers who actually memorize. Uh, various books to try and keep them alive. It's it's very it's very interesting and powerful, uh, and you know it's been made into movies and definitely definitely is a great uh, great dystopian classic. Number five, Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner, 1969. You a lot of younger people probably aren't familiar with this, but this was extremely popular in the day. It was very very highly acclaimed. It was kind of the new wave of sci-fi very relevant, very edgy, and uh, it had lots of characters, and it had um, uh, sensitive topics like sex and drugs. So it takes place in 2010, <laughs> in which the U.S. is overpopulated, and uh, the world has 7 billion people. So he was really close on that. He was really close on that uh, estimate. And the name comes from the idea that if you stood every human in one place, we would fill up the island of Zanzibar completely, shoulder to shoulder. And so this society, in an effort to combat 
overpopulation, they resort to eugenics, and they promote drugs and, and sex and propaganda. Uh, they're engaging in all these senseless wars, including, you know, in Southeast Asia, still. <laughs> and they have some interesting slang, kind of reminiscent of Clockwork Orange, only more, more English. And they also have these fictional books by this fictional author, which is, which is a device a lot of writers use to, to introduce uh, specific ideas in little drabs of exposition that may make it a little bit more palatable. I remember, I remember it being as, as, as very edgy and interesting and uh, really sad in places, but it kind of, it kind of ends up that there's this African country that, that uh, the corporations and the government wants to exploit that some of these people are trying to protect called Beninia, which is what was the name of an ancient Af African kingdom, I believe. And uh, it's portrayed as kind of utopia, which is interesting uh, because, you know, it just seems in human history there's never been such a thing, unfortunately, no, much, no matter how much we want to believe in Shangri-La. There's also some scary genetic engineering going on in this island in Southeast Asia as well. So it's very interesting. And I'm probably going to revisit it one of these days because it's been a while. Number four. This one everybody will know. Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, 2008. Uh, this is a, one of the most celebrated, celebrated young adult novels of, of all time, really. And it was made into a, uh, it was a trilogy. And it was made into a, a very successful series of movies. Uh, star, starring the lovely Jennifer Lawrence as the kick-ass heroine <laughs> who, and, and I love the fact that it plays to her strengths. It, it's realistic. It pre plays to her experience as a hunter, as a huntress, <laughs> we might say, and her, her survival skills. It doesn't have her um, physically overcoming uh, males much more powerful than her. It, it, it plays to her cunning and intelligence and determination and heart. And this is a very moving book at times. At times it, it drove me to tears. And if you've seen the movie, you remember the scene where young uh, Rue dies in the arena. I'm going getting ahead of myself because I think people know the story. That in this dystopian future, the America has been depopulated and it's ruled by this horrible uh, elite who forced the um, people of each district to submit two young people, two teenagers, to battle to the death in these horrible annual games called the Hunger Games. Whoever wins gets more food rations. <laughs> and, and Katniss Everdeen, uh, the heroine, is, is uh, volunteers because her little sister is randomly chosen. And she takes her little sister's place and she has to try to survive. And it's very wrenching and very sad in places. And, but a lot of interesting dark humor that really made me laugh at times. And some of the best character names I've ever heard, like Effie Trinket, <laughs> as one of the uh, elite media people. Uh, really love it. Absolutely one of, the, one of the best. Number three, here's the sleeper hit. Here's the one I want everybody to check out because it's great. Zone 23 by C.J. Hopkins, 2015. C.J. Hopkins is a blogger. He's an American expat and playwright living in Berlin. And I kind of followed his blog, which is why I ended up reading this book. And this is a dystopian vision that, that adheres very closely to the current state of the world. It's, it's a world run by corporations, and they've erased national identity completely. And they, be, everything's become market territories. <laughs> you know, you don't have any, you know, you're not... American or Russian or French or anything like that or Japanese and people the most people are called normals and they are uh, you're zealously monitored if you have any kind of psychological problems at all which is everybody you're forced to go on these psychiatric drugs to keep you on your emotions in check if you fail in any way you, they get uh, th they, you get branded as an antisocial person, and you get put in a special residential area, which is essentially a ghetto, as Zone 23 is, where it's very violent. The police are owned by the corporations, and they don't pay any attention except when there's any kind of rebellion, and then they come in with uh, machine guns from from aircraft and just mow everybody down. <laughs> so it, it's it's pretty awful. 
but yet these characters kind of persevere in light of all this awful oppression. There's there's a ghetto dweller who was born there named Taylor Bird, and he's a a thug, kind of like Alex in Clockwork Orange, but he's it's kind of redemptive in that his girlfriend is pregnant, and it's illegal to, to uh, propagate without permission, without a license. So he has to try to protect her from being um, from being punished, and it kind of makes him a man uh, essentially, and not and less of a thug. And there's also Valentina Briggs, who's she's one of the normals, and she's kind of this yuppie who has this wonderful life, and uh, she's uh, they have this approved baby that's on the way. She's pregnant, and then she suddenly has all these psychological issues, and. Uh, becomes detached from reality and flees uh, and there's these there's one particular horrible scene with this uh, rather do-it-yourself medical procedure that was kind of wrenching I probably skip that but other than that it's it's a fantastic story that really hits you where where you live because it's really a lot about what society's like now unfortunately number two and you probably know the last two. I'm sure you do if you know anything about dystopias. Number two is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, written in 1932. I guess I hadn't realized that this one was written by the other famous one, which is going to be my number one. It was the earliest of, of any of these in the list. And so this is a world where the family's been abolished. All babies are, are done by, you know, IV fertilization and, and grown in, in in uh, te not test tubes, but they're grown in special chambers. We have promiscuous sex. We have uh, approved drugs that people take, and we have four castes from alpha to delta, and depending upon their intelligence. And this is actually engineered in the womb. I mean, they actually put like alcohol into the into the embryos for deltas to make them dumb, <laughs> and the alphas are given ox extra oxygen and so on. And so these castes are. So you've got a rigid place in society, and there's this world state, and it involves this this uh, a journalist named Bernard, Bernard Marx, who is out. Um, he takes a vacation in one what what's called a savage reservation, which is a place where people actually have some freedom, but they also have poverty and disease, and they actually people are actually born normally. <laughs> And uh, he befriends one of the savages and, and brings him back, uh, and uh, that ends badly. <laughs> and and it, and it's interesting because this is this society is a lot like Western modern society, and it's not entirely the the ending isn't entirely grim. I mean, it seems kind of hopeless, but at the same time, you think that maybe Bernard he's going to be exiled and not killed or anything. And that exile may be a good thing for him. So, so it's it's interesting. Um, it's like one side of, of dystopia. You know, they basically stripped humanity from humans and destroyed the family, which is a horrific, awful thing. Number one, of course. Can you can you say it with me? 1984 by George Orwell, written in 1949, and the original title was 1948. And which the, the publisher said, that's ridiculous. But the whole point is that the narrator, uh, Winston Smith, he doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know what, uh, what year it is because the party, kind of like the Communist Party, uh, has basically basically uh, eliminated the, the modern calendar and you don't know what date it was by the old calendar. And uh, you have the, the infamous Big Brother who rules everything. And whether he's a real person or not, we don't know. He's on telescreens everywhere. You have televisions you have to watch, and they watch you back. And uh, make sure that you're obeying and doing your calisthenics when you're supposed to. That kind of thing. The world is divided into three huge super states. And the one that um, Winston Smith lives in is Oceania, which is basically the Americas plus, plus Britain, plus the British Isles, and you know some pieces of other, of other places. And they're always at war with these two other dystopian, horrific, totalitarian countries called East Asia and Eurasia. Kind of like uh, Soviet Russia and Red China. Winston Smith, he is in love with this woman and it kind of drives him, him into exploring these other 
to getting in, he kind of goes down a rabbit hole of dissidents and people who are, you know, on the outside of the party. And eventually, of course, it ends badly for him. <laughs> and he's caught and subject to torture and so on. And it's, it's a horrifically depressing book, but something that's important. And I think everybody should read it at least once. And it shows the, the more brutal side of, of dictatorship, though, that they deprive people of family, and even sex is, is cast as evil. Because as we know, uh, communist societies were very intolerant of any sort of sexual deviancy, deviancy at all. I mean, they would kill you if you were gay or, or lesbian or whatever, you know. They, they, didn't, they didn't have any tolerance of that whatsoever. And so, so it's definitely a very a succinct and very apropos to that sort of society. Now I have two honorable mention, mentions for this because they weren't actually novels. At the risk of making this as kind of a long, kind of a long spiel here, uh, number one of the honorable mentions is *The Minority Report* by Philip K. Dick. You may have wonder, wondered why I didn't mention this. Published in 1956, because it's a short story, not a novel, and uh, it was made into a movie uh, starring Tom Cruise, um, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, and it's a very famous story where the government has an agency that predicts crimes and arrests you before you have time to commit them. <laughs> and it's weird because they have this these psychic powers, they have these three kind of mentally uh, challenged people <laughs> who are essentially prisoners who make predictions. And uh, they they can somehow, they have these psychic powers they know, but what happens is the police commissioner is fingered as a future murderer and he has to figure out why. <laughs> you know, he suddenly he's on the other side of the law and he has to figure out why. So it's very fascinating. The movie definitely doesn't follow that closely to the it's the same premise but it doesn't follow all that closely necessarily to the to the story. They always change a lot of Dick's not Dick's stories when they adapt them. But both are good, definitely. Other one is a movie and this was Brazil, nineteen eighty five by Terry Gilliam, the American member of Monty Python. <laughs> and this was a, a very, and directed by Gilliam, and this was a uh, dystopian Britain, uh, starring, the movie star Jonathan Price as a poor schlub, he's like a bureaucrat, and he works in a, a horrible tiny office, and he encounters this beautiful woman who's like this renegade, and he wants to meet her and all this stuff, but you know, of course, the police are after him, and, and he's got some interesting, like, De Niro's in it, <laughs> in kind of heroic role. So it's a very uh, funny and cynical and uh, amazing movie. Yeah, I mean, you really should see it, absolutely. If you haven't seen it, definitely see it. This is my list. Let me know if you think this is a good list, if you think there's stuff I've missed, or disagree with any of my selections. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying thank you for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe because that helps us a lot. Come back soon to the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.